Right, well, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this session on ethics in international arbitration. My name is Jonathan Wood. Uh, I am the head of uh, international arbitration at RPC, and I'm also the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. This is a panel session uh, when I will introduce my panelists in a moment, but I'm always reminded on a panel that timing is of the essence. And I'm reminded of the panel session where the chair was a very dry American uh, a, a attorney, and one of the panelists was a rather pompous, shall I say, continental European professor of law. And when it came to his time to speak, the American turned to him and said, Professor, please limit what you have to just six minutes, at which point the professor pumped up his chest and said, how can I possibly share all my knowledge with you in just six minutes? To which the American chair said, speak slowly, professor, speak slowly. Mm -hmm. So with that admonition, impliedly <laughs> to my panelists, may I now introduce them. So on the screen from Moscow is Tatiana Mineva, who is uh, co-head of the Russian uh, group and uh, at RPC, and also a specialist in international arbitration. On my left, I have Genevieve Poirier from La Live, another specialist in international arbitration. Genevieve has a very colorful background. She was born in Canada. Uh, she qualified in New Zealand. Uh, she has an Irish passport, which entitles her to appear before you today, was with an American firm, Scadden Arps, and is now with a Swiss firm here in London. So we have a very broad jurisdictional background on my left. On my right, I have Marion. <laughs> Marion, you're from Wales, I believe. Uh, we have Marion Smith, QC, who is a very well-known counsel and international arbitrator from 39 Essex Court. So with that introduction uh, of my panellists, may I turn to you, Marion. And you want me to introduce the topic. So the title is, Is International Arbitration an Ethical No Man's Land? Or are there rules of conduct applicable to counsel, arbitrators and funders? And when I was given the, host I'm sorry, when I was offered the opportunity <laughs> to uh, introduce this, I thought that I would use other people's words because it's what I spend a lot of my life doing. And I thought, particularly after the sad news this weekend, that I would look for words from the great and the good. And let me share with you three to set, set the scene, to start the story that we're going to tell. The first one is from Jan Paulson. 30 years ago, he said this, in cases where counsel come from two different countries, where standards are quite inconsistent on a given point, does the client whose lawyer is subject to the lowest standard have an unfair advantage? Makes you think. The next one is from the great, late Johnny Vida. 20 years ago, and like all good counsel, he both asked the question and answered it. He said to the question, what are the professional rules applicable to an Indian lawyer in a Hong Kong arbitration between a Bahraini claimant and a Japanese defendant represented by New York lawyers? The answer is no more obvious than it would be in London, Paris, Geneva and Stockholm. There is no clear answer. And he then went on to say this, the fact that international arbitration practitioners do not usually share the same national legal culture does not mean that international practitioners are pirates sailing under no national flag. It means only that they are on the high seas. Navigators need more than a coastal chart. So that's what we're going to do. We're on the high seas. Using his coastal char coast chart example, we're going to consider what do those coastal charts say? Do these charts all say, here be dragons in the same place? Do we need more than a coastal chart? Have we found it? What does it look like? And who should apply it? Over to you. Thank you very much, Marion. And as an example of where 
issues arise on a multi-jurisdictional basis, we thought we'd look at the issue of witness preparation, uh, because there are a range of views across the many jurisdictions in the world where very large differences arise. So what I'd like to do is turn to our very multicultural jurisdictional uh, panelist on my left here. And uh, Genevieve, um, would you like to start off? I mean, you're with a Swiss firm now. What would the view be taken from that point of view? Yes, thank you. Um, well, you might say jack of all trades, but <laughs> there we are. Um, I've spoken to my Swiss colleagues uh, because this wasn't, wasn't uh, an answer that I knew. And I was perhaps surprised to learn, and, and perhaps the civil lawyers amongst the audience will know this already, but even contact with witnesses is forbidden, at least as a matter of court practice in Switzerland. So you, know, you do not meet with the witness, you don't take a witness statement, you don't cross-examine them. And the reason for that, of course, is to avoid manipulating or influencing the evidence. And I think what we're going to talk about more generally, is how are we going to get to the truth, the true truth, and what is our responsibility in terms of getting a witness there, both to the court and, and also as, as practitioners. Um, but of course, uh, in the Swiss system, and the same in, in France and in Belgium and, and in Italy, probably many other places, there are carve-outs, and there's a carve-out in the Swiss um, rules as to uh, whether or not a practitioner can have contact with a witness, and of course they can. Um, the Swiss Bar Association has professional rules that allow that in a way that otherwise the prohibition uh, would just exclude entirely. Um, so it's not improper for a Swiss lawyer to interview witnesses. In the context of international arbitration. Exactly right, exactly right. Um, but what are the contours of that, of that permission? Um, really, only that nothing in the course of preparation should compromise that witness's ability to give truthful evidence, which, you know, actually is, is true of our system here in England and, and of many other places. But the question is the method by which we get to that truthful evidence. Um, I think, Marion, do you want to talk about I, I do, but I'm still England. struggling. What do you do in Switzerland with a witness? Because, I mean, they just turn up? In the courts? Yeah. Yes, well, I, <laughs> yes, I suppose. I mean, I think the, the, the civil system, of course, is much more interrogative. Yeah. And so the questions are put by the court. It is a, a much more limited form of questioning that parties can put to their own or opposing witnesses. It's nothing like the Anglo-Saxon tradition, as I understand it. No, well, the, the Anglo-Saxon system, the rules that operate for anyone who's an advocate here, and that's, you know, that's not, these, these are not bar rules, these are advocate rules, so they apply to solicitors and to barristers. It's quite clear cut as part of the duty of honesty and integrity, nobody laugh, okay? A very clear duty of honesty and, and integrity. You must not rehearse, practice, or coach a witness. There are a number of subset rules about you mustn't put forward uh, facts you know to be false. You mustn't draft a statement to be signed containing facts that you know to be false. You mustn't persuade a witness to give a different account. But you are allowed and indeed encouraged to familiarize a witness with the process of giving evidence. And we have now, I think, this divergence, don't we? On one hand, coaching allowed, dragons on the other side. Sorry, coaching disallowed, forbidden. That was, a, I hope, not a Freudian slip. Familiarization completely acceptable. And where's the line between the two? But you are allowed to conduct a mock yep. cross-examination, provided that it is not on the facts of the case that you are dealing with. Yep. Yeah, and that's, that is permissible. It's permissible. It's regarded in the most of the courts as pretty um, useless. They'll describe it as, um, what's, the ex what's that wonderful expression from the TCC? It's about as much use as a chocolate fire guard. 
But I think there are, I mean, there's service providers who now do familiarization so that you can have, I mean, every, people in this room will be familiar with Bon Solon, for example. And then you are, as the practitioner, protected from the shadow risk specter that your familiarization has gone too far. Your witness can truthfully say, how were you prepared? I was, I had a mock cross-examination, I, I was shown the room, I was told what the arbitrators do, but I you know, can say hand on heart, it wasn't by that council over there. And they, of course, then didn't have the opportunity to tell me what to say. Can we do a quick, can you put your hand up? Who's used a witness familiarization provider? Yeah. And there we are, and there we are. And it, it, yeah. um, it demonstrates, I think, in part, you're complying with your ethical responsibilities. And the witness isn't put into a, an odd or concerning position where they have to think about whether they are allowed to say what they discussed with you and whether it was proper or not. Yeah. Now, I, I think we may have lost, have we lost uh, Tatiana, who is in Moscow. Because uh, I was going to ask her while the search. I just, I just wonder whether you hear me because I also lost video, but I, I can hear you. We can hear you. Like. <laughs> okay. Well, Tatiana, I mean, you, uh, you, you're in Moscow as we speak. Uh, you have extensive experience of dealing with witnesses from Central and Eastern Europe. I mean, how do you uh, view this? What, what's your experience of dealing with? witness evidence um, preparation from your perspective? Uh, thank you very much, Jonathan. So I was asked to contribute from the perspective of CIS disputes, which are heard in uh, London or Washington. And I should say that my experience is very diverse in this respect because I started practicing international arbitration in Moscow where I worked in a US law firm, and then I moved to London, and I worked in London in English law firms and also in US law firms. So I have approximately 50-50 experience working for US law firms and for English law firms. And uh, I should say that, <laughs> I should say that the approach to witness preparation is rather different, as you know, and we will discuss it later. But in terms of uh, Russia and generally CIS countries, I would say that we don't have any issue as it is or problem of witness preparation because uh, this classical uh, witness testimony, as you see in Anglo-Saxon countries, they, it doesn't exist in Russian courts and in classical Russian uh, arbitration, I mean uh, ICAC court, for example. So the issue is not regulated and uh, Normally, uh, like in Switzerland, the witness will be called to testify in court or in arbitration very rarely, only in relation to certain document, whether it was signed or not, or in relation to some tangible evidence. But there would be no uh, written witness statements. So the witness would come, will tell the story, will be asked questions by various parties and mainly the judge. And that will be it. So for Russian witnesses who give testimony or who are called for cross-examination in countries like London or Washington, uh, it's, a, it's a wild west, I would say. And in my experience, they just, uh, the whole idea of having to be forthcoming about issues is, uh, is very alien to, uh, well, not just Russian witnesses, uh, many European witnesses. I once remember that I had a German witness and I mean, he just wouldn't say anything. <laughs> you know, you thought, if you don't say anything, we're not gonna win this case. Uh, but uh, it, it is quite yeah. difficult, isn't it? Because it's a yeah, complete yes. culture shock for them in many respects. I, I in my experience, I mean, I've seen uh, witnesses giving cross-examination, I mean, giving answers during cross-examination in various tribunals in Washington, the witnesses are if they are not prepared, um, I would say by by U.S. law firms. I mean, I, I I speak about my U.S. law firm experience. They 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 will be completely confused. They will not give answers to questions. They will try to give to to tell some story. They will not listen to uh, questions at all. They will be lost in translation. They will lose their. They will not if they are directed to the document. They would not know what to do. Uh, 
sometimes they're intimidated, sometimes they are not, they don't understand why the barista or whoever <laughs> or US lawyer is so aggressive to them, you know, so it's, it's a mess, to be honest. <laughs> Now, again, looking at the audience, uh, I wonder how many of uh, the audience are US qualified? Put your hand up if you are. Uh, well, we have one or two. Okay, so uh, <laughs> let, us, um, let us look at the other extreme, should I say, uh, for uh, how things are dealt with across the pond. Um, I say this with some feeling because uh, I personally was in a case we, uh, in the USA. Uh, it, was, it started out in court, but then was referred to uh, an arbitrator. Uh, we had uh, 50 witnesses who were deposed uh, in the case, many of them over in this country and then a number over in, uh, in the USA. It was a, a London market case, so we had about 20 insurance uh, uh, witnesses who had to give evidence. The 50th witness, uh, having been through all the other witnesses, was myself. Uh, rather foolishly, I was nominated under Rule 30B6 as a corporate representative. The US lawyers will know what that means. And I was deposed for two days. And the issue arose was, as an English solicitor, could I be prepared in the way that the US lawyers prepare their witnesses? Now, many of you will know that there is a complete difference. We have the very restrictive approach here in England under our uh, rules of advocacy. In the USA, as my US colleagues, uh, friends will know, um, there is a positive duty to provide competent representation, which translates into the fact that you are under a duty to prepare a witness, and it would be negligent of you not to do so. Would I be right in summarising it in that fashion? And the preparation uh, goes so far, uh, you, cannot, you are not allowed to falsi help, uh, falsify the testimony, but you may clarify the way in which an answer is given, uh, and you can have a mock cross-examination on the facts of the case, which is totally different to the approach that we take. And, uh, you know, I was told, well, you are going to be prepared. And, and my answer was, no, I am not. Uh, but I was taken through some of the questions that I might be asked, uh, not so much as a sort of mock cross-examination. But uh, we had quite a battle on our hands as to whether I should be prepared. I think the expression that is used over in the USA, are you horse shedded? Um, you know, witnesses are horse shedding. And I mean, my, in my experience, because I've sat on cases where it, it is quite clear that a witness has been prepared a la USA, and they come over as totally wooden in my experience. I don't know how you've found this, Marion. Have you had the experience or either of you sat in cases in that fashion? Well, I'd like to sort of move this into the, the bigger question as to, to what extent are we now going to continue to rely upon witnesses? Because we, you know, you look back at how they discovered the truth in the 12th century with ordeal by battle uh, and ordeal by oath, and you think, crazy, simple people. And now we're told, don't rely upon memory. It's only crazy, simple people who think that you've actually got such a thing as a flashlight memory, a flashbulb memory, that memory is constant. Because all the research now indicates that in fact your memory is rewritten, written over, changed, shaped by a variety of factors, some of which you could guess, of course, obviously your interest, the need not to be defensive, um, but also simply by the whole process of an arbitration, by being shown documents that you didn't see at the time. Now, once you know that, does this ethical question fall away? And do we in fact now say, don't need witnesses, we should just be doing this on the documents? What do you think, Genevieve? Well, that, I mean, that does bleed into uh, witness statements. And, yes. uh, wow. and, and I, I do want to come on to, maybe not immediately, but I do want to come on to the new practice direction here in the commercial court, which is, which is very prescriptive about um, 
exactly that, whether a witness can look at documents. And if they do look at documents, which documents? They need to set them out. Well, let's, let's say, make this comment. I mean, the way in which witness statements are prepared now in international arbitration is preparation by any other means, frankly speaking, is it not? And I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the way in which you see some of these witness statements or even memoranda prepared, I mean, it is, you have to think that the ethical lines that, <laughs> that are set, uh, you know, the boundaries that are set are being pushed to the limit when you see the witness statements that are being provided. Well, in. You, you've noticed how the whole world talks like a lawyer. Yes. <laughs> you know, there's everyone. Yeah, the concept that it's in someone's own language. I mean, there's words that they've never heard of in, in their lives. Yeah. Um, and lots of, in Latin maxims. I'm not sure how many of your you know, <laughs> surveyors speak in Latin max maxims, but not very many. Yeah. And that, I mean, certainly the commercial court here is trying to get its hands around it. Is it doing a, you know, the right thing? Well, we'll, we'll see but all laudable, all about trying to give the court or the tribunal the truth, um, and what is the best way to do that? Is it by showing a witness a variety of documents? Is it by stitching them together in their witness statement so that they can tell the story, which then they learn and becomes implanted? Or is it, you know, I can't remember what I did two days ago without looking at my calendar. Is it really about reminding the witness that that is what happened, that is the context. They did go to that place on that day, and therefore it's totally appropriate for them to see all of the documents in the sequential order as they appeared. But you're right, both here in the commercial court, which is what they're trying to stamp out, and in arbitration, it tends to be that witness statements are used as another form of advocacy to tell the entire story of the creation of the contract, people's mindsets at the time, and to comment on what someone else says is the truth. Whereas now, under the new pr practice direction, a, a witness is going to be very restricted to talking strictly about facts that cannot be divined from the documents and facts that are particularly within their own knowledge. That doesn't seem that controversial, but for example, now the preparation of witness statements here for court work, for trial, is going to mean that uh, you, know, you can't provide a witness with a, a draft statement for them to consider. You're going to have to interview them with non-leading questions and see what they come up with. This is, mm, yeah. yeah. Well, this, uh, well, one of the things that I've noticed now, if I may say, I started my career as a criminal defense lawyer uh, for six years in the north of England. And um, what I observed when I moved away from the criminal courts into commercial law is that the art of putting on a witness in chief oh, has just been lost completely. So, I, I, I mean, it's all very well, you know, sort of saying, well, this is where we're going to go to and everything like that. And you put your witness on at your peril. I mean, you know, quite often. But the, the market's not going to, if you do that, it's going to extend the length of a hearing. Mm. That's going to push the cost of what is already an expensive process up. I can't see the market accepting that. And I mean, the ICC in their own report looked at this whole issue because memory fallibility is genuine. That's, mm. you know, it's like climate change. It's, the, it's real. But what do you do in arbitration? How far can you as an arbitrator maintain your distance from the process, allow the parties to tell the story they want to tell? And the parties do want to tell their story. Is it, is it you know, yeah. they want to have their say. Yeah, yeah. And so, and, and impose a code I mean, the only thing I've seen imposed on a code basis is that in most arbitrations, the panel will say, as a witness hits a coffee break or a lunch, don't talk to anyone. Mm. Can I just ask, has, everyone, has anyone seen that rule knowingly broken? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. One. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, one. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of hands fluttering up. Yeah. The interesting thing, and you can tell me after the coffee break, is did you realise at the time it was being broken because the witness comes back in and says, do you know what? Because <laughs> <laughs> you've got a story about it. Well, I was just saying, I, we just discussed this, but I was, um, yeah, I was in an arbitration and our witness went away for the coffee break. We didn't 
speak to him. And he came back and he said, you know, actually, I just want, uh, there's something I said before, before the break and I just want to, that was wrong, that was wrong, I want to start again. <laughs> and I mean, we're horrified. The other side is jumping up and down. <laughs> And they want to know, who did you speak to? Where did you go? What happened? We were incredibly lucky that the witness throughout the coffee break had been sitting with one of the arbitrators. And it had just, you know, come to him. But otherwise, there would have been no way, no way we would have convinced the other side or the panel that we hadn't tampered. And he wasn't sitting with his party, his party appointed. No, no, he was sitting, <laughs> he was with the chair. So there we are. I mean, it was all, it was all above board. But I mean, you, you wouldn't have believed it. You wouldn't have believed it otherwise. No. Let me go back to this difference between the English and the US system, because um, how do we regulate that? Um, you know, how do we get a fair hearing? And uh, someone in the audience knows I'm going to call on them because I had to have lunch with him the other day and say, this is what I'm going to discuss. But Peter, <laughs> <you're>, <laughs> you uh, were clever enough, may I say, Peter Ashford from Fox Williams, you were clever enough to get an order from your tribunal how to deal with this issue. Would you like to share your experience with us? I was doing the advocacy for, for my clients, and the other side had a, had a silk who happened to be dual qualified, uh, US and English. Uh, and I was concerned all the witnesses would be in America or be, would be American. Uh, and I was just concerned how the process of preparation was to go. So I asked the tribunal for an order, and I said I didn't particularly care what order they made, as long as we got a level playing field and we all got the same rules, subject to what I was ethically entitled to do. Uh, and uh, the tribunal was a Canadian in the chair, uh, a New York lawyer uh, appointed by my opponents, and we had a retired uh, Court of Appeal judge uh, who we had appointed. And the, uh, the, up, the, the New York lawyer on the, on the tribunal was, uh, as Jonathan mentioned, apoplectic, saying, <laughs> but, but it would be um, unethical not to prepare. You can't possibly impose that on, on somebody. But the, the majority of the tribunal, I suspect, it just came out as an order, uh, accepted that. And we got an order that preparation of witnesses would be on the, uh, the... We thought there was a slight distinction between the Solicitor's Code of Conduct and the Bar Council Code of Conduct. So we got the, an order on the most restrictive... Uh, mode of preparation uh, subject to the Solicitor's Code of Conduct and the Bar Council rules. So the, an the answer is to... To ask for the order. Ask for the order head on in, in the early, you know, for a proceeding... Yeah, well, it's got to be a PO1 in, or pretty early, early on the, uh, before, the, before the prep is done. Yeah, exactly. which, uh, which is very sensible, if I may say, Peter. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, policing well, it. What, what, how do you well, get compliance? Let's move on, shall we? <laughs> to the issue of regulation. Now, uh, Tatiana, you're sat there in Moscow. <laughs> Prague rules are what you're used to. How, how does that help uh, with regulation? I, 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 Jonathan, with all my respect, I'm not used to Prague rules because actually Prague rules were introduced just in January 2019 and it's a, it's a new, new thing in international arbitration. It was uh, adopted, I think, as an alternative option to IBA uh, rules on taking of evidence in international arbitration. And earlier today, uh, it was said about parties, they want to tell their stories to the arbitrator. And so arbitrator just sits and kind of manages the process and listens to the parties, how they tell their stories. Whereas Prague rules, they set out alternative method of uh, proceedings where arbitrator takes an active role and arbitrator actually decides how the process is going to run. For example, in respect to witnesses, uh, arbitrator decides whether witness will be called and which witness will be called. And uh, even if the party insists on a particular witness to be called, arbitrator can still decide not to call that witness if arbitrator thinks that this witness is not helpful or doesn't have any material facts, a direct knowledge of the material facts. So uh, this is in essence what our, uh, the Prague rules are. I don't know whether, how often they are applied now mm. in international arbitrations, but I should say that 
Prague rules, they don't only govern the taking of evidence, they govern also other aspects of the arbitration procedure. That's why it's very difficult to apply Prague rules in the institutional arbitrations, whereas uh, Prague rules may be applied in, in, um, in ancestral, in ad hoc arbitrations. So this is, in essence, uh, my, my, my brief observations about Prague rules. To be honest, I have never applied Prague rules myself. So, but I think that institutional rules like ICC uh, inter arbitration rules and uh, ICOC in Moscow, as well as uh, other arbitration rules, they do uh, mirror Prague rules in respect of um, powers which arbitrators have in comparison to uh, Anglo-Saxon um, institutions in uh, Anglo-Saxon world. Yeah, thanks. So, might I ask, I mean, how many here have actually applied or, uh, the Prague rules, perhaps rather than the IBA rules on taking of evidence? I can't see a single... Yeah, yeah. So, how many? <laughs> so, here's the obvious question: How many have you used the IBA rules on taking evidence? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, very interesting on the relative take-up of the two uh, types of rules that uh, govern the way in which evidence is taken. Can I just ask? What about? Sorry, Tatiana. What about the IBA guidelines on party representation? in addition to the rules or separate from the rules. Yep. So some, so some, maybe we'll come back to that in a minute. Well, while we're doing that, Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, <laughs> Code of Conduct for Experts. Anyone? A few. A few, a few. It's, it's the IBA, they've absolutely. They've nailed it. Yeah, yeah. taking of evidence. Right. Okay, well, so here's a clear example where, you know, preparation of witnesses, changes, according to which jurisdiction uh, or where which who regulates you which bar regulates you and such like so let's just move on to this more general question uh, and ask the question you know which institutions or what is the role of institutions in terms of policing uh, I mean we've just touched on this what is the role of institution in policing the way in witnesses are dealt with or other issues which arise during the course you know it could be confidentiality it could be privilege but there are different ways of it being dealt with in different jurisdictions how um, what is the role of institutions in that regard now the first thing i always say is well the starting point is the court of the seat uh, yeah. has the ultimate role in regulating a process but you can't keep rushing off to court uh, you have to, that role has to be delegated. Where do we go for looking for that sort of, uh, that, that, that guidance, if you like, on, on the ethics of arbitration? You've mentioned the IBA. But it, I find it phenomenally difficult, Genevieve, and we've, we've been talking about this. I mean, there's, there's so much sort of piecemeal stuff out there, and, and, and it's more coming in. But I, I keep thinking there's just some basic rules, aren't there? We all know what the rules are. We've all got some powers now, but we don't really enforce them. I mean, if, you, if you're faced with rogue counsel, you can do something about it, but we don't. Faced with a rogue arbitrator. It's, it's true. I, I think, you know, for counsel, obviously their, their local bar and their jurisdiction are the ones that should be sanctioning them and when that is removed is it really for the tribunal yeah. to come down on advocates and it, that is difficult for a tribunal including because their powers of sanction are not so strong i mean you can exclude evidence you can variety penalize people in costs um you know pre prevent witness evidence from being admitted but they are they're relatively light they are. And, I, and costs, the trouble is you're penalising the wrong person, aren't you? Yeah. You're penalising the party. Uh, I've never seen, a, and I'd be interested if anyone has, a costs order made against counsel personally in an arbitration. But then I think the risk is if you, if you penalise counsel, you are, well, one, arbitration is a consensual process, the arbitrators are being appointed by counsel. 
if a council feels hard done by, you're much more involved in the process in a way that the the courts of the seat or the bar is is not. And there can be a, a complaint against the arbitrator for bias potentially, or maybe a complaint, um, a challenge to the award. So it, the, the panel is just so much more involved with the process. I think it's hard for them to put, uh, you know, a real hard sanction um, against the parties or, or council. And that's one of the differences between the court and an arbitration tribunal, because there are reported cases in, in this country of awards being made against a witness of, for costs. Yep. Uh, 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 there's, there's one reported case at least yep. on that issue. Uh, but, I mean, again, the tribunal would be, you know, I mean, I think it would be very dangerous if, if I was sitting here, I'd be very reluctant. Don't, don't take your own gospel on that. But, <laughs> no, but I think but the LCIA does provide powers to the tribunal. So again, let me ask the audience. Are they used, yeah. Has anyone had the tribunal invoke its powers during an LCIA tribunal to police the conduct of counsel? They have these powers. Ah, <laughs> there's somebody there who's had an awful lot of experience in an awful lot of cases, I suspect. But again, looking around the room, you know, um, it's, it's a power that has been granted under the rules, but not exercised. So maybe then the question is, how many of you have thought about... <laughs> <laughs> ah, now that Heart one... Got, yeah, now that one got you laughing. So what stopped you? Because it's, it's, it's what we come back again time and time again to go back to the commercial court example with the witness statements. There's nothing, absolutely nothing new in that practice direction. All of that's been said for years, but we never listened. Mm -hmm. So they thought, right, had enough, put it in one, get it out there. And so that, to that extent, it is, it's hitting the profession anew because we've just not applied it, not done it. Now, the LCIA have given you these rules and everyone's thought about it, but not. Now, what stops you? Is it just, is it litigation, is it dispute fatigue? Had enough, been too many battles, it's too hard, CFO won't pay for it, doesn't want it, doesn't need it. What is it? I don't know. We can ha have, have one-to-ones outside and yeah. find out the answer because no one's going to come forward. But, I mean, we do have codes of conduct, we, you know, so the LCI has, yep. has it in their rules. Um, the Chartered Institute, yep. which I'm the chair and Marion is my deputy, um, we have our code of conduct, um, which is laid down, but is limited to, arbit to when you're sitting as a neutral. It, yep. does, it is under the review at the moment, and one of the recommendations that I have made to our uh, professional conduct committee is that it must not only apply to those sitting as neutrals, but also to those who are members of the Institute who are acting as counsel, uh, because I think that they too should be brought into the fold for acting with integrity, to put it at its, at its briefest. But so you and I did a bit of inquiring this morning. How many times has the disciplinary code been used uh, by the Institute in, since 2009? Well, it, this is to, to take the post-nominals away. So it says to take someone out of membership of the yeah. Institute. There are, there's a whole gradation, as you'd expect, of sanctions twice. Twice since 2009. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, but, but it's got teeth. It's a power there because if, if you get the ultimate sanction, you can't use the post-nominals. You lose that with membership. And I, that might, I don't know, maybe I'm biased. The only... The one case I do remember of those was when an arbitrator was so slow in delivering his award that action had to be taken. Yeah. I mean, that was the egregious action. But um, uh, other sorts of, you know, sort of bad conduct, if you like, has never, you know, sort of seen its way to the disciplinary process, as far as I, I'm aware. I mean, it's, it's bad conduct universally, isn't it? If you're late with the award and... Sure, of course. Yeah, of course. I was, I was just thinking as you were discussing it, if the sanctions aren't working, fine. So we give up on having rules with sanctions. Do we then go back to what you were suggesting, Marion, which is everybody knows what the rules are and what we should do and have a, a general sort of code of conduct, which is 
ICA has come out with their yep. code of conduct this year, uh, very not prescriptive, very much about civility of practice covering all sorts of areas, mm -hmm. and whether soft rules, like soft guidelines like this, are actually all that we can hope for. And then at the beginning of our own individual processes, we decide consensually what we're going to be guided by in order to, as you say, level the playing field, but only then using the tools that are available, mm -hmm. um, but not relying on rules with sanctions that n nobody applies. Mm -hmm. And I mean, uh, the may, 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 may I interrupt yes, here, please. unfortunately? Unfortunately, it's, I, I still don't see the audience. I don't see, I have video, but maybe I, I, just, I just can say my view that uh, the most efficient from my point of view is the cost order in international arbitration in respect to parties' conduct. I think that this is the only real instrument which might affect the parties to conduct in the most efficient way. Yeah, and, and the clients will see that. <laughs> <laughs> the client will see it, but do you exactly. think that that does does that change the the practice or the behaviour of counsel? So they've been caught out once, or you know, they, I assume you presume Depends. that you don't think that it was uh, as egregious a breach as uh, as warranted costs. And what are you going to Depends. do about the arbitrators? How are we, because what you can do in many court systems is you can um, ask the Ministry of Justice to. Uh, compensate a party that has lost out through a fixture that couldn't be held or a judge who's delayed. Should we put in place a system, maybe the ICC think they have, of um, penalising arbitrators? They dock the fees mm. for late awards. Should they say to the parties during the course of the, uh, the arbitration, you're just about to, we've got the award before we give it to you, so it's not going to affect the award. Do you want to mark your arbitrator? Do you want to tell us if your arbitrator you think was incorruptible, honest, fair, and efficient? And then we'll think about reflecting that feedback into the amount of your money we pay the arbitrator. What do you think? <laughs> Silence. <Yeah. laughs> but I mean, the, the ICC does ask for feedback. It that. does, but it doesn't go into any... I, I checked it. No, it doesn't yeah. go into anything about this. No. And uh, I think there is, you know, there's this idea of having a, a sort of... Um, uh, doing due diligence on arbitrators and yep. all this sort of thing. I mean, it's it, it's whispers in the corridor at the end of the day, isn't it? The <laughs> quite Quite often. I mean, it's a fairly closed community practising international arbitration around the world. And you kind of get to know about the arbitrators and you kind of get to know about the council and you cut your cloth accordingly. But the world, in a world which is committed rightly to equality and diversity, so you are going to spread the net far wider. Yeah. How are you going then to police a bigger community? You can't build your monitoring on the fact that everyone knows everyone because that's, that's rapidly going. Well, not only that, and that gives the same problem with the sanctions. Are you going to sanction a party who will probably appoint you again? I mean, it's just, it's, it's too tight. It's too close. Yeah. Right. Well, the six minutes. <laughs> Should we ask the last question and then the we'll last, take their question? I was going to yeah. say, um, we had one polling question which we thought we might put to the audience. Uh, is our pollster there in the... Uh, Come on, push it up. <laughs> it's a very simple question. And if you don't... We just wanted to use the technology. We're trying to use the technology as ever. Is it with us? Okay. If the question is not being put up, uh, I will ask it. You can, a show of hands. Is there a role for one institution to have universe... Ah, here we are. Is there a role for one institution to have universal control over the ethical standards in... in <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, How many people polled? Two? <laughs> yeah. Seems pretty clear. So it's pretty clear. Uh, that, uh, if we could do a more, be on more recent things, 
Thank you. Whoever the last two were. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, come on. <laughs> right, 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 right. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Oh. oh. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Now yeah. you're playing with it. Now, now it's, it's irresistible, isn't it? Come on, do it. Okay. Okay. 60 40. Well, that's more balanced. Yeah. Hmm. Very good. More balanced than I would have thought. <laughs> ah, come on. Does it cost you back? Sorry, sorry. We'll stop there. Yeah. Hands down. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you all. Um, must have been a very engaging discussion because we have a lot of questions in. And unfortunately, you know, a very small amount of time. So apologies if I don't get around to your question from the audience and online. Uh, perhaps I'd start with um, on, on the sort of discussion around coached evidence. Is it not the case that coached evidence is almost always exposed by competent cross-examination? It's how good the preparation is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and no, it's not. It's not. I think the, the idea that a witness goes, oh, my God, you've got me. I lied. No. <laughs> Hollywood. And I think the problem with coaching, good coaching, is that the witness now believes that that is the truth. Mm -hmm. So it, it isn't a question of catching them out in cross. They've now learned a new version, a new gloss mm -hmm. on what their actual recollection was. And uh, finally, just because we can't eat into the, the break session too long, uh, what considerations need to be applied to vulnerable witnesses? Torture has been raised as an issue in commercial disputes, and the question asker raises the CFHNA versus Shagang dispute. I'm not sure if that's one that you're aware of. Yeah, vulnerability is something we struggle with. Uh, it's, I think you will have seen it coming into the criminal courts, um, and we're acutely aware of coercion I don't think we've begun to have that conversation in international arbitration yet, and I think we may rapidly be entering the times when we need to, because it's going to be a new normal, but a very, very difficult environment. I have been in an international arbitration between two uh, Eastern European countries <laughs> involved where the look was flashed at the witness and the witness just dried up yeah. and that was quite clearly as a result of the threat uh, that he felt that he was under for saying any more I mean he just dried completely yeah. and said I, I can't you know I can't say anymore no. so we are in part so yeah still. yeah I mean yeah. it happens yeah uh, I'm afraid um, but it happens in court as well you know I mean it's not just limited to that part of the world uh, it, 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 no. it happens all over the place. No, I, think the, I think the pressures of climate change and yeah. the pressures on our society are going to result in us coming back to... I world. wouldn't like to be a magistrate in southern Italy. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about vulnerability and witnesses. Yeah. I think, unfortunately, in the interest of the time, we're going to have to wrap up the session, but please join me in thanking uh, the panellists for an unbelievable <laughs> session this afternoon. <laughs> Uh, we've just got over 10 minutes now for a break and there'll be another, the final session of the day which you should please come back for at 10 to 4. Thank you. <laughs>